sidebar. So you're going to switch with the person who introduces you. Okay. Um, when you're done, you'll be introducing. I will not be introducing you. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to switch to administer Calandra. Yeah. Sorry. So and Steve Hogarth will come up. So if we want to do a trial run, so we'll switch. You want me like to step back or Yeah, so you're just going to switch. Just like this? It, however you want so to. So we'll yeah. switch. Yeah, come here. You'll switch and then we'll, we'll go to there. Okay. And then when Dr. Doris is done, you can invite Minister. <laughs> you know how to do it. Yeah. Make sure we do it right. When you're done, you will invite Mr. Kalander back up and we'll get to the media Q&A. We'll have Ms. Jessica Hughes again. Yeah, no problem. When you're at the podium, you can remove your mask. That's all Ms. Jessica Hughes wants. Any questions? Okay, excellent. I'll let you know when you get it up Good morning, everyone. Honorable Minister Kalandra, Ms. Christine Hoggart, Dr. Doris Greenspan, dear guests, it's our great pleasure and honor to have you here today with us. It's a historical moment. Minister Kalandra, we all know that change is always difficult. We have been watching your ministry. It's, it's been changing and integrating Ontario long-term care system, ensuring that our seniors get the care they need and deserve. Recently, you announced the investment to help create much-needed new full-time positions for RNs, RPNs, PSWs in long-term care. Thank you for allowing long-term care homes to play a role in addressing acute care challenges we had in our province. Thank you for providing us with tools on dementia care. You and your ministry made the right decision to restart the respite care program, which was closed during the pandemic, and provide support to caregivers who are taking care of their spouses and loved ones at home, giving them a chance to have a break when needed. Thank you for allowing us to set aside isolation beds during the pandemic and for putting them back into the system at the right time. Thank you for all the support during the COVID pandemic. Different funding provided by the ministry to our home helped us to improve the quality of care for our residents and create a better work environment for our staff. Thank you for approving funding for our air conditioning system. You notice it's in place. We greatly appreciate your initiatives to build a new long-term care beds across the province. We at Ivan Franco Homes thank you and the Ontario government for supporting our development application and helping us to realize our vision to build a campus of care, continuum care for our res seniors and our residents, current and future residents. Thank you. Now I would like to invite Christine Hoggart to deliver her remarks. Thank you, Christine, for supporting our home and our community. Well, thank you very much, Olea, and good morning, everyone. And I just want to acknowledge all the staff I see you up there and behind us. I just want to thank you for all the work that you do every day to care for our most vulnerable people. We call these uh, homes homes, and they're homes for a reason because we have these tremendous staff here that are so dedicated to their job every day, and uh, that takes a leadership and team. So thank you very much for your work and your leadership and uh, your care. It's a pleasure to be here today at the Ivan Franco Long-Term Care Home for this exciting announcement. And I want to welcome my friend and our house leader and minister of long-term care, Paul Calandra, uh, for his work to address the long-term problems that have affected our long-term care needs throughout the province. Once again, I want to say, thank the staff and the volunteers and those who came to join us today. And I also want to thank the minister 
for the investment of 200, sorry, 376 new long-term care beds right here in South Etobicoke. As part of Ontario's aggressive modernization plan, the government has taken steps to create the long-term care sector that is resident-centered, which will provide the highest quality of care for our loved ones. The devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our long-term care sector further shone a light on the complexity of staffing challenges in the sector. Due to apparent staffing challenges across the health care sector, the province has worked towards minimizing that shortage through investments including education, recruiting and retaining more than 3,700 more health care workers. One of the reasons I got involved in politics was to fix the problems of the past. And I'm proud to stand here with our minister who is also dedicated with our party to, to fix those problems and make Ontario such a better place to live. The announcement today is part of our plan to stay open and I'm proud to be here for this great news to assist our long-term care. We know that today's investments are necessary to supply our seniors as well as our most vulnerable with the health care they need, when they need it, as well as allowing them to receive these important services close to home. The provincial government will continue to work with the province to make sure that our seniors remain a priority in receiving the best quality care possible. I would now like to invite Minister of Long-Term Care, the Honourable Paul Calandra, to the podium to share details about today's announcement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, Dobroden. Uh, it is uh, very nice to be here. And uh, as uh, MPP Hogarth said, uh, thank you to all of the, uh, the the frontline workers who have done so much. Uh, Dr. Doris, uh, in every uh, meeting I've ever had with uh, Dr. Doris, she reminds me the moment that I see her that uh, you cannot have a, a, a long-term care system without the extraordinary work of all of those people, frontline workers who've done, who have done not only an amazing job but during the pandemic but before and will continue to do for a long time. So I really, 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 truly appreciate everything that you have all done and will continue uh, to do. And again, it is very nice to be here at uh, the Ivan Franco home uh, for this important announcement. This is a beautiful place. I, I, this is my first visit here. And it is just absolutely beautiful. So thank you for allowing us uh, uh, to be here. I, I just wanted to take a moment, if I can, to um, uh, uh, not only, again, thank you for allowing me to be here, but also want to highlight uh, the commitment our government is undertaking to support the Ukrainian community and Ukrainian newcomers who have come to Ontario as a, as a result of the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. From helping, senior, from helping newcomers find, uh, find jobs, access health care and education, to providing funding to help Ukrainian newcomers through settlement services, we stand with the Ukrainian people as they defend their homeland against the terror and carnage of Vladimir Putin's illegal inv invasion. And again, also, thank you, Olya and George, uh, Chair of the Board of Directors, uh, uh, for welping, welcoming me here again it is an absolute pleasure to be here done such a fabulous job uh, uh, not only during the pandemic uh, but continue to do so and as you said one of our first uh, to get air conditioning uh, uh, in your home so I can't thank you enough for all of the hard work that you have been doing so today I want to talk about uh, the work our government is doing to fix long-term care and to ensure that every long-term care resident experiences the best quality of life supported by high quality care our approach is built around three pillars and you've heard me talk about it a lot improving staffing and care driving quality through better accountability enforcement and transparency and building modern safe and comfortable homes for our seniors now today's announcement is focused on the first pillar staffing and care as we continue to invest in fixing the long-term care sector after decades of underfunding from the previous government it is crucial that we have the staffing in place to provide residents with the care they need that is why our government is committed to ensuring residents receive a system level average of four hours of direct care per resident per day from nurses and personal support workers by March 2025. Now this is something that advocates have been calling for for decades and we have listened. We passed legislation last year that actually enshrines this, the commi this commitment in law with the Fixing Long-Term Care Act. And I'm here today to announce another important step that we are taking to deliver on our commitment. I'm excited to launch the Hiring More Nurse Practitioners for Long-Term Care program. Through this program, we are investing $57 million over the next three years to recruit and retain 
up to an additional 225 additional nurse practitioners for the long-term care sector. Now, nurse practitioners, they play a key role in ensuring that residents receive the best quality of care. They are part of a healthcare team that develops, supports, implements, and evaluates uh, residents' care plans. They also provide leadership and mentorship for other staff, enhancing their knowledge and abilities. As part of the program, eligible long-term care homes will receive financial support for hiring nurse practitioners. The funding also provides up to $5,000 in relocation support for nurse practitioners who are hired full-time to work in rural communities. In partnership with the Ministry of Health, we are also investing in an additional 38 student enrollments in nurse practitioner programs this year alone. This is just one of the many, many investments that we've made to address staffing shortages in the long-term care sector. In total, we've committed five, over $5 billion over four years. We've invested $175 million to expand home care services and $117 million for the sustainability of these services. Because we know that providing the best quality of care means providing the right care in the right place and at the right time. Now, as I mentioned before, the fixing to fix long-term care, we need to raise staffing levels, but we also need to drive quality through better enforcement, accountability and transparency, and to build safe, modern, comfortable beds for seniors to call home. And that's why we are investing over $72 million over three years to double the number of inspectors across Ontario. It's why we've introduced the new, new administrative monetary penalties to hold homes accountable and to ensure the safety and well-being of all residents in long-term care. It's why we're investing $6.4 billion to build more than 30,000 new and 20,000 upgraded long-term care beds across the province. And we are making great, uh, great progress in, in, uh, in this. I just want to, uh, to conclude by, by saying that part of uh, what uh, the Premier uh, uh, talked about right from 2018 was the need to ensure that the investments that we made in long-term care transitioned uh, long-term care from a place where people stayed to a place where people could call home. And, and this is one of those facilities that does it best. It is one of those facilities that we look at as a model for how other long-term care homes should be across the province. When people come here, it is their home. It is where they build uh, on the next stages of their life. And I can't thank you enough for the, the, the work that you do. Uh, and with that, it gives me great pleasure, and I have to say that uh, Dr. Doris and I, uh, we don't always agree, I think it's fair to say uh, we don't always agree, but Dr. Doris has become one of the most important people that I speak to on a, on a, regular, uh, on a regular basis. Her advice uh, to me is, uh, is, has been second to none, and she's not afraid to stand up uh, for the things that uh, she believes in. She's one of those people, I, I think I can say this, one of those people that uh, often it's the ministers that come before the microphones, but it's people like Doris who behind the scenes fight so hard and advocate uh, so hard and have helped us make so much progress over the, uh, over the last number of years. So it is a, uh, a great privilege of mine to be able to introduce and call uh, Dr. Doris up to the microphone. Dovery then. Uh, first, to the seniors that I just spoke before inside, because this announcement today is for them, and that's the most important. Uh, especially in this home, uh, Ivan Franco Homes, uh, Aliyah, I know firsthand the suffering that they went through. Uh, not only during the pandemic, by not seeing families, by not being able to be out, by the tragedy that happened not only in Ontario, but across the world, across the world during this pandemic. A lot of learnings to do about keeping families out and a lot of learnings, including for our NEO minister on that. Uh, second, in this home, and I was really pleased when they told me that it will be in a Ukrainian home, I can only picture the tragedy of these seniors that are there, and I spoke briefly with them about their families and the suffering that they are having even from thinking about the homeland. Uh, RNO sent a mission to uh, Ukraine uh, with CIMAT minister, and in fact we are still there, courageous nurses, doctors and others organized by RNO and CIMAT are still they are helping first at the frontiers between Poland and Ukraine. 
and now actually in Ukraine. So Aliyah, I also know the suffering that staff, many of whom have either families or are descendants of families in Ukraine that you are going through. I lived in a country of war, and let me tell you one thing, war doesn't bring peace, ever, ever. So those of us that stand, that stand on the line of peace always will win, Minister, and I'm absolutely thrilled that Canada is standing on the side in no uncertain terms of Ukraine. So is our new. And that goes for the federal government of Prime Minister Trudeau, and that goes for our Premier Doug Ford and for all his team. Uh, second, um, it is important because I can only uh, think uh, with ache about what happened during the pandemic. And it is important to know that the tragedy was in Ontario terrible, and so was in the rest of the world. In fact, I just finished a comparative analysis of four countries, and there is nothing but learnings to do and ache in the heart. So the announcement of the government some time ago of the four hours, which RNO at the time uh, called it nursing home basic care guarantee, was already a step in the right direction, and we much appreciate that. And the announcement today of Minister Calandra, and I don't know if we don't agree on everything because I am yet to disagree or he to disagree with me. He may not be as fast as I would like on the announcements, but he is, and today is an example of that. Uh, Minister Calandra takes keen interest on long-term care. He's dedicated, and he understands with his heart, not only with his mind and his capacity brain and that's important to understand why we call home a home and to put the right staffing and to put evidence-based guidelines which RNO has uh, advanced for many many years and Alia I would welcome you to become a best practice spotlight organization because I think here they're all nodding because I think the staff and the residents will absolutely gain from that. We have about 300 nursing homes already, BPSOs, and we are working on embedding the guidelines in electronic medical records, and that will be the next announcement, right, Minister? Here you go. But today's announcement about nurse practitioner is crucial. You need to know that during the pandemic, nurse practitioners who can diagnose who can prescribe by legislative authority, and this is not new. They can diagnose and they can prescribe both in primary care, long-term care, hospital care, and across the entire system because it's legislation, played an absolutely central role during the pandemic. They were the ones that were there 24 by 7 in the homes that were lucky to have them. So for Minister Calandra to stand here today and say 20, 125 more and 38 more spots in universities, we are asking for 100, so we, we are still need to keep pushing, but that's a very good start, is an amazing announcement for residents. And it's an announcement because it will ensure that residents get safe, quality, and timely care in place in their home and wouldn't we wish all to get care in our home rather than ending up in emergency rooms. It will no doubt prevent in the homes that have them to transfer patients to hospitals. And that's not to save the hospitals, which always seem to be the narrative. That is for the residents in the homes, because to be in a hospital for an IV or to be in a hospital because you have a urinary tract infection and you get confused with aging on that. It's not a good thing because many times people come back from the hospitals, not for the fault of the hospitals, but because they have many more urgent things like accidents. They come back perhaps without the confusion, but in a worse shape physically, emotionally, and socially that they went. 
So to treat them in the homes is vital, and the announcement today will do just that for the 75 homes that will be fortunate to get this year nurse practitioners. My question to the minister, and he's coming after me, so here you go, he can answer what happens if we get 100 homes asking. And I would say, minister, if we have the NPs and you get 100, fast track, fast track. The moment every home in Ontario will have a nurse practitioner will be a good day for residents. And it also will be a good day for staff, for all of you, because it will help you feel supported in your clinical practice, where you are a PSW, where you are a nutritionist, where you are a dietitian, where you are an RN, an RPN. It will help you feel supported in their practice. It will give also families peace of mind. So the fastest we move to one nurse practitioner in every home, the more retention of staff we also will have. So, Minister, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. You never saw my remarks because I don't write remarks. And for having the trust that you will get always an honest uh, view, an honest evidence-based um, feedback from RNO on the files that we are looking. And yes, that we will push for what's right, what's right across the entire system. I had the privilege to meet last week with the uh, Premier Ford and with Minister Elliott. And I have never seen so many people in a room, never in my life, my president and myself, and, and we brought frontline nurses from all sectors. It was an absolute privilege, and I expect more change to happen, and I expect it to happen fast. So to my colleagues, please know we stand with you by you, whether it is on the conflict. It's not a conflict. It's a brutal criminal act that is happening in Ukraine or whether it is in the care of residents. Dobri then, thank you. And uh, thank you for, for all of you, for the work you do every day, and to the residents. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Doris, and thank you, Olya, and, and of course, thank you, MPP Hogarth. I have to tell you, uh, um, MPP Hogarth is one of those uh, MPPs that sometimes I try to avoid in the House because she's always advocating. I can't tell you how often she's talked about uh, about this this place, but uh, I don't know if there is actually a, a stronger advocate for advocate for her community than uh, MPP Hogarth. Uh, uh, and uh, I could actually take lessons from uh, from uh, from you on that front. So you're very well serviced. I have to tell you by uh, by uh, by Christine. But uh, uh, with that, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to uh, to take any questions that you might have. Thanks, everyone. We're just going to have you uh, line up by the microphone over here. And if we could just have you announce the uh, name of your media organization, uh, followed by a question, then one supplementary. And then if there are any other questions, we just ask that you circle around to the back of the line and just allow everyone a chance to ask some questions. Yuri Belinsky, New Pathway Ukrainian News. Uh, so. Uh, is there a room for expansion of this program because there is uh, over 600 uh, LTC homes in Ontario and uh, yeah. uh, there is only 225 at the moment? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's clear, and I think Dr. Dr. Doris was uh, highlighted it uh, uh, certainly better than I did. Uh, the the importance of nurse practitioners across the the, uh, the healthcare system, but in particular in long term care home, I think uh, is 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 very very clear. So what we're trying to do is uh, is bring forward whether it's the nurse practitioners, whether it's the uh, uh, the over 27,000 additional healthcare workers that we're bringing into the long term care system to reach our four hours of care by 2025. What we're trying to do it is in a phased approach so that we know that we can bring the people. Uh, online, uh, there are obvious uh, challenges that that uh, that we are uh, that we are facing in terms of health and human resources. But we want to try and do this in a in a in a fashion that we that we can uh, ensure that we uh, we deliver on. So I think it is it is uh, it is uh, very important. As uh, Dr. Doris said, it's game changers in in a, in, a, in a lot of uh, of instances, and uh, it is part of uh, the progression that we're seeing in long term care because long term care homes. Uh, uh, you know, as, as, as Dr. Doris mentioned, you know, uh, 
you know, they can provide such an awesome level of care, certainly a better level of care than we, we see when, uh, you know, having a patient sit in a, in a hospital room. So we can be part of a solution for the first time in generations. Long-term care can be part of a solution. So it's part nurse practitioners, part uh, uh, healthcare workers. It's getting to that four hours of care, and it's helping build new modern uh, 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 long-term care homes that uh, that people are proud to, to work in and making sure that our homes aren't uh, uh, aren't facilities but they are homes like you have done here so there is room and the government is proceeding in a fashion that we can ensure that we can deliver on the commitments that we made as we struggle through the health human resources issues over the next uh, number of months thank you morning minister Liam morning. Casey with the Canadian press um, so you said before the new uh, long-term care law that came into effect a few weeks ago, you're hoping to free up about 200, at least 250 beds in the first six months. Do you know where we stand right now, and how many how many beds have been freed up? Uh, look, uh, we, we're, we are monitoring that, we, but we said right from the beginning uh, when we were doing this that we want to ensure that we worked as closely as possible with uh, patients in in our hospital systems to find the right. Uh, uh, right space uh, for them. The goal is, of course, uh, to have, um, as Minister Jones said at the time, uh, uh, by Christmas to have uh, 400 beds uh, available. Ultimately, in the long in the long term, we're looking at freeing up freeing up up to 2,400 beds. Uh, but we want to ensure that uh, that when we do this, that uh, we work closely with the families to ensure that they are getting the best possible placement as close to home as possible, uh, and that the the long term care home that is accepting them. Uh, is in the best position in order to uh, to help them uh, uh, help them do that. So it is one of the tools in the toolbox. Uh, we're going to do it right, but ultimately, as the Minister Jones uh, said uh, at uh, the press conference a couple of weeks ago, look, uh, we want to get to uh, uh, have 400 beds uh, 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 made available. The ministry's goal is up to 2,400 spaces made available, and that is based on uh, on a number of different factors. You know, as we remove the isolation beds. Uh, that were so important in obviously in the in the first uh, waves um, in respite care I'm glad you mentioned respite care because this is such an important part of this as well a lot of people forget that uh, there's so many people who struggle in home that take care of a family member uh, and their only outlet was the hospital so bringing back respite care in our long-term care homes also takes uh, a lot of the strain off so we're moving in the right direction uh, uh, and uh, as I said in the press conference I'm, I'm really excited that long-term care can be a part of it uh, but we'll do it in a way that is respectful that respects the the, the patient uh, in long in uh, in, uh, in the hospital system as they approach uh, becoming a resident in a home have you heard any updates on on the new law like are hospitals actually using their new powers uh, look I have, I have I, my understanding is that hospitals are uh, uh, are, are, uh, are beginning those discussions. As I said uh, when we announced this, uh, a lot of this is about continuing the conversations uh, with, uh, with patients in, in the acute care system. So are they accessing? Yes, absolutely they are. They're, and it's, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is part of the conversations that we have with patients that we weren't allowed to have before. Uh, so that is what really started almost immediately with uh, the passage uh, of the bill. And as we, uh, as we move forward, those conversations will lead to uh, appropriate placements in, in long-term care homes close to home. I don't know if there's anybody else here, so I might just keep asking. The uh, so mask mandate in long-term care homes, Dr. Moore has said uh, he hopes to see that in place till uh, summer 2023. Will you commit to the that as well? Look, always be guided by, uh, by uh, the advice of, of Dr. Moore. I've, uh, I've been uh, very well served in my time as, as a long-term care minister by, uh, by uh, uh, taking the advice of, uh, of uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Health as it's uh, uh, guided by local medical officers of health uh, as well. So uh, always be guided uh, by that. But ultimately, uh, uh, at the same time, I want to make sure that, uh, uh, that we do in ensure that loved ones have access to their family members in long-term care. Uh, uh, it was a challenging time for many, many people, not the least of which were the, the health care workers who, who did just such an amazing job. It is really hard to quantify the work that they, 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 they did and how amazing they were. But ultimately, we want to make our long-term care homes open, let people continue to visit with their, their family. Uh, and uh, again, just be guided by uh, the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health because it served Ontario so well over the last number of months. Sure, yeah, please. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I, I do want to say uh, that Ontario was the first province in this country that opened uh, the homes to uh, the families. And I briefly want to say the story so you know the type of staff uh, that you have, because ministers are important, so is the staff. And please do let her know, because she doesn't work. <laughs> 
at the ministry anymore. But I was with a group of families um, that were devastated. Uh, families contacted us a lot during the pandemic. They were devastated that they couldn't be with their loved ones. Uh, it was at the same time that Arenio was rethinking, quite frankly, the issue of leaving the families out. Uh, we were already hearing um, uh, concerns about uh, the shortage of staff and, and the residents uh, being lonely and the, the isolation inside on their heart of the residents, not just physical. And right there with the families, I took myself, as I have done with you, Minister, and I am very fortunate that the Premier uh, Minister, or in this case, Rana, who was the staff at Minister um, um, Christine Elliott, I believe, or at the Premier's office, actually, took the phone, as they always do, and that's to their credit. It's, it's a way of communication that uh, is tremendously welcome. And I said, Rana, I have a group of families here talking, it was of course uh, on the phone, and they are devastated by this, um, this, this, you know, prohibition to visit their loved ones. And Areno, in fact, is rethinking based on, we don't see how this has helped, uh, the whole approach. And we already had sent a document to both the Premier and the Minister, um, ministers at the time, and, uh, and Rana said, can I hear them? And she did. And actually it was Rana that took it to the Premier. And Ontario was the first home that opened the doors uh, during um, uh, the pandemic to families. So um, I, I, it's music to my ears and I'm sure to families and to staff uh, to hear the minister, Minister Calandra say, we want the homes open to families, and I, and, and I stand unequivocal on that after all the, the study and the research and the writing and the discussions with our board and the discussions with experts that never again we should close the homes uh, to families. We need to find the ways to ensure that it's safe, and in this case, of course, it's this. So we also concur with Dr. Moore. Um, in fact, I wish we had not taken this out of uh, the flights because next week I'm flying and I am going to put mine. Uh, but, uh, but I think nursing homes is critical to continue till at least early fall and see what happens when people can be out, etc. cetera. Um, we are being very nice with you and so is a couple of you, but outside you really don't need masks. Uh, but uh, a, a not tongue and cheek to have when residents can be out, when residents, that's okay to be without a mask, but during the winter it will be a mega mistake. So I'm really uh, pleased that you are uh, reassuring us of that because uh, I think that it bodes well to residents, it bodes well to their families and to, and to staff also. So. Thank you. And I also want to say, I didn't know that I have a twin uh, in the legislature, uh, <laughs> MPP uh, Hogarth. So maybe we should kahoot more and maybe, you know, uh, it will help us to get to what the colleague said here. Uh, the issue Minister Calandra mentioned is also an issue of human resources. Nurses and other health professionals don't grow in trees, we hope that it would, but it takes, takes time to prepare a nurse practitioner. It's not only an RN, it's an RN that did additional education and legislative requirements and, and an exam. So it takes time, but uh, with the increase of 38 seats, we know that we have a 70% increase in applications to the nurse practitioner program, so be assured we will be in fact, I think I'm meeting with the minister this week. We will be trying together to convince uh, Minister uh, Jill and, 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 minister and, and others to probably the Treasury to put the funding to more nurse practitioner spots because it will be a game changer, as the minister said. This was a new um, survey came out from uh, Angus Reid today that shows Ontarians are divided on the new long-term care law, and uh, uh, it's about a 50-50 split whether the, you should have went ahead with that or not. 
And among progressive conservative voters, about a third of them say it was unnecessary. Just want to get your thoughts on that. Look, uh, I, I'm guided by, uh, uh, by ensuring uh, uh, that uh, uh, the people that we serve have the best quality of care at the right place at the right time. I've said it time and time and time again. Uh, I don't think there is any disagreement uh, uh, that somebody who is waiting to be in a long-term care home uh, that is on the waiting list, uh, that they are better served in a long-term care home. I mean, you only need to come to a place like this and see, where would you rather be? Would you rather be in a hospital ward when you are on that long-term care waiting list, or would you rather be in a home? A home where you can start to build uh, uh, new relationships, new friends, uh, and, uh, and where we keep you close to home, close to your family, while you wait at the top of the waiting list for your preferred home of choice. It is the right decision uh, to make. Uh, but I understand, look, I will say this, I, I do understand. Uh, that it, change is always going to be difficult. Uh, I, I get it. Uh, so I'm not, um, I don't want to dismiss people's, uh, 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 you know, fears. But I can tell them that it is guided on ensuring the best quality care at the right place at the right time. And, uh, and I am committed, uh, as is uh, our entire government, uh, to making sure that uh, uh, everything that we promised is what we see happen. Uh, and uh, uh, that is why we're putting the resources behind uh, additional nurse practitioners. That's why we put money into, uh, into the long-term care homes to support this transition from, from acute care into long-term care. So I'm actually excited about it. And you've heard me say it a million times, probably ad nauseum. You're probably sick of hearing me say it. But like, I'm excited by the fact that long-term care can be part of a solution. We've talked about this for decades and long-term care has never been in a position where we could actually be part of a solution. It's because of the investments that we're making, it's because of the partnerships with RNAO, it's because of all of these people and everything that they did during the, uh, uh, during the pandemic. You know, before the pandemic, I'll stop at this, I just I get really passionate about this because I, I, I believe very strongly that this policy is the right policy, but you know, when you look at the work, the heroic work that our frontline workers did during the pandemic, a lot of people thought they couldn't do it, but they did it. And now it is up to government to ensure that they have the resources uh, to, uh, to, to continue that quality, to improve that quality of care, and we're doing that by building brand new modern homes, by putting more uh, health care professionals into our long-term care system, by adding uh, nurse prac uh, practitioners. Uh, this is all part of uh, building an integrated health care system, and we're finally transitioning Ontario, uh, Ontario's health care system uh, to one that reacts to one that, uh, that, uh, that all Ontarians can be proud of uh, and meets the needs of all Ontarians. So I'm excited by it, but, but, but look, I don't want to dismiss uh, 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 people's uh, fear of change, but it is up to us to make sure that it's successful, and I am absolutely positively committed, along with my colleagues, uh, to ensure that it, uh, that it does, and, and with people like the RNAO, with, with doctors. I met with the OMA yesterday, this, the, the same thing. We're all committed to making sure that our healthcare system gets better uh, and that uh, we put the patients uh, first. And as my parliamentary assistant says, nobody wants to be a, 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 a patient. They want to be resident of a home, and that's what we're getting to. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure, yeah, please. Um, so you're talking about Bill 7. Uh, let me tell you one thing. I was director of nursing decades ago at the Mount Sinai Hospital. The issue of people uh, in alternative level of care is not new. It only has been increasing. And even back then, I was devastated by people that were not in the right place. So the question is how to move with this, and I think the minister alluded to the issue close, closer to home as possible. The issue of the fees is what people are divided. But I don't think you will see anybody divided to, and if they are, I invite them to come with me to any hospital of this province, uh, to see that uh, people that uh, are deemed um, as needing long-term care or needing home care, the hospitals are not the best place. Not because the hospitals are not good in Ontario, but it's as much as a hospital can do and cannot be for everybody. It cannot be for primary care, hence why we need to expand primary care. It cannot be for home care, hence why we need to expand home care. And it cannot be instead of long-term care. Uh, you do not require, I mean, you are in the media, you have seen, and I am not speaking against any particular hospital, can happen in any hospital. If you are with a workload that you are running all day in a unit in a hospital, and you have a patient that has absolutely acute care needs, 
and you have a person that doesn't have the acute care needs, you run to the acute care needs, it's not the place. So the question, and I think you minister addressed it, uh, is how to move with it. It's not a new conversation. And, and I think, Minister Calandra, I like the way you, f you frame it. It's about conversations with families and with residents, not only with families. Many residents can, you know, and, and I tell you, I wouldn't have someone in the hospital today. I would first have them at home if I can, and I did it in another country. So uh, the expansion of home care is important. And then if, if, if there is a need for institutional care, uh, it's long-term care, it's, it's a home, it's a home. And I would encourage you, and I will send to the minister a document that we release. It's called Enhancing Community Care in Ontario 3.0, because we did it in 2012, was 1.0, in 2014, was 2.0. And it inspired, actually, the Ontario Health Teams. Christine Elliott will tell you that it is. And in it, we said that long-term care needed to be part of community care not of hospital care, of community care, because it's home. And you, have, you demonstrated life with your amazing staff here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. That'll conclude the media availability for today. Perfect. Thank you all. Thank you for coming.